Hi there, this is Manuel from Entagma. It's me again. So my absence is finally over and I'm pretty glad about this. So this new fresh Entagma tutorial comes from my side. And today I want to cover something I saw online recently, which stunned me and I wanted to give it a try. And this is polyfolding. So opening up an object or splitting an object apart into polygonal strips that are then curling backwards to open up the object. Quite a neat effect. And it looks intricate, and it is intricate, because it uses a lot of linear algebra, as um, we are dealing with matrices a lot. So let's directly dive in. Let's get started, because we have to cover a lot of stuff in this tutorial. Okay, inside of Houdini, create a geo node and call it polyfolding, or something similar, dive inside. Let's create a geometry to work with. In this case, I use a plain sphere, but set it to polygon and then up the frequency to say 20, because we need some polygons to work with. And to make it look a little more interesting, let's append a mountain to give it some irregularity, like so. So let's lean back for a second and think about what we want to achieve. First, we want to split up this object into individual primitives. And then we want to treat these primitives as if they were objects. If you want to do a curling effect, usually what you do is you use, for example, bones or individual objects on the scene level, because you want to use transforms. Here on geometry level, we don't have transforms for the individual primitives. So we have to come up with the transforms ourselves. But before we do that, we need a metric to split up the object. Because we don't want to have individual primitives only, but we want to form a structure. We want to put the individual primitives into a structure of parents and children. And this parent-child relationship then determines which polygons transform together or curl together, which polygons belong to the same strip. So to create this metric, we first have to parameterize the object. And we do this by using the distance to a point. So let's create a point by laying down an add sub. And if you tick this checkbox, you get one single point and you can transform the point in the viewport. So this is our point. And now we want to compute the distance from this point to each individual primitive. And for this, we need a wrangle, a primitive wrangle in this case. Append it here, call it parameterize and connect the point to the second input of the wrangle, make the wrangle visible. And now press Alt-E over the text editor or the vex field here to get a bigger editor. And now let's uh, think about what we want to do. Well, first we need the location of the point. We can import this location into a vector attribute, so vector, and let's call the attribute or the variable target position. And we will use a point function and pay attention here, because uh, the point is coming in over input 2, so we want to use a 1 here for the geometry stream. The attribute to import is p, and then we need a 0 for the point number or the point index, because it is the very first point that we want to read the location from. Now, let's create another variable of type float, called distance, and let's use the length function with the vector between at p, which is the position of the centroid of the primitive in a primitive wrangle context, and this red target position, like so. Now this is holding the distance from the point to each individual primitive. And now let's just write this to a primitive attribute. So at dist is dist, like so. Let's apply and accept, and let's check with the geometry spreadsheet, go to polygons, and here we have the distance attribute, ranging between 0 0.39 to 2.5, like so. Great. To see what we created, let's lay down a visualizer and make it visible. Go to visualizers, attribute to visualizers dist, like so, and now ramped attribute. And you can see we have a ramp of an attribute here. Now let's use this attribute to sort the primitives. 
turn on primitive numbers, you see that you have random primitive numbers, more or less random primitive numbers here on the object. And we want to use the attribute to neatly sort them. So lay down a sort sop. A sort sop. Like so. Make it visible. And now say primitive sort by attribute, and the attribute to use is dist, the attribute we just created. And as soon as you put dist here, you see that the primitive numbers changed. So here you have it. And if we append the visualizer to the sort, we can check here on this side, we have high primitive numbers. And on this blue side, we have low primitive numbers. So the primitive numbers are now sorted by the attribute. And that is a nice first step in splitting up the object because now we can use the primitive numbers to determine which primitives are children and which primitives are parents. Now let's create another primitive wrangle. Primitive wrangle. And let's call this one find parent. because we want to find a parent to each individual primitive. So each primitive should find its own parent with a logic that we want to implement inside of this wrangle. Same procedure as always, Alt E. And now the very first thing to find a parent is to find the neighbors of a triangle because each triangle has three neighbors and one of these three neighbors should be the parent that will be used as a transformation parent. This triangle here, for example, could choose one, two, two, seven as its parent and then it will rotate around this edge while curling. So let's implement this. The very first thing that we will need is the neighbors. Fortunately, we have a vex function for finding the neighbors, even the polygonal neighbors. So the result will be a integer array. Let's call it poly underscore neighbors underscore here neighbors. And we need brackets here to indicate that, that this is an array attribute. And now we use poly neighbors like so geometry stream zero and the primitive that we want to use for our search is primnum, the currently processed primitive we want to choose the neighboring polygon that has the highest ID. So let's first create a variable of type integer called parent. And let's initialize it with minus one, indicating that this is not yet a usable index. And now we do it for each loop. Because we want to loop through all found neighbors. So for each neighbor, and then poly neighbors, which is the array. Curly brackets, like so. And inside of this loop, we want to do an if statement to compare the currently processed neighbors index to parent, the variable we just used. So if the neighboring index is bigger, then whatever we have in parent, then and only then, curly brackets, we want to update parent with nbr. So this logic says, please start with the very first neighbor. If its index is bigger than minus one and all indices are, then put it into parent and go to the next neighbor. If the index is bigger again, then put it into parent. If not, do nothing. So after this loop finishes, we have the biggest neighbor or the neighbor with the biggest index. But there's one thing that we want to add here in the if statement. We need a logical and because we want to test another condition. And that is the neighboring number should at the same time be bigger than the prim num. So we only want to search for indices that are bigger than our own index. Great. So now after this loop, the parent variable will hold the correct parent for our primitive. So let's write it to a primitive attribute of type integer. So I add parent, and this will be parent, like so. Let's test. No errors so far, make this visible, still no errors. Let's go to the geometry spreadsheet and then to 
polygons and we see, okay, we have parents here. And some of the primitives have a parent of minus one. And that means that these polygons don't have a neighbor that has a bigger index than themselves. Okay, cool. Now we have the parents. And that would be sufficient if we could use recursion to go through all these primitives and find the correct order. But we cannot, unfortunately, as Vex does not support recursion. So what we have to do instead is to find all the parents for each individual primitive. So each primitive has to know all the parents up to a primitive that has minus one as a parent, which is basically a root primitive. The next thing we want to do is gather all the parents. This fortunately is not very complicated. We just need another wrangle, a primitive wrangle. Append it here and let's call this one gather parents. Gather parents, make it visible. And let's find all the parents for each individual primitive. First, we'll need some variables. So an integer called parent, which we initialize with zero. Then an integer called index, idx, which will initially be the primnum. And then an integer array, the parents. This is our result array. And now we want to do stuff while parent is bigger or equal to zero. So that means as long as the parent we find will not be minus one, the loop will continue. As soon as the parent index will be minus one, the loop will stop. And that is exactly what we intend because primitives with a parent index of minus one are root primitives and there the chain stops. So now let's first import the parent. So parent, and we don't have to initialize the variable here because we already did so in front of the loop. Prim, geometry stream is zero. The attribute to look up is parent. And idx is the index. So it will start with the currently processed primitive and find its parent. And now we append this to the array. So append, the array is parents. And we want to append parent. Now the first parent is appended to the array. And now we want to make index the parent index. Because this means that now the loop in the next iteration uses the parent of the parent, so the next parent. And it will just continue through the entire object until it finds a primitive with a parent index of minus one. Then it will stop. So after this loop we have an array with all the parents. So Let's say i and then brackets. This is a syntax for creating an array attribute. Let's call it parents again, not to confuse stuff. And let's fill it with our parents array. So let's see what this gives. Let's press apply and accept, make this visible and go to the geometry spreadsheet. And here we have our array. If I extend this here, you see that all the primitives have a parent array. And of course, these very high primitives have a short parent array because they are close to the root primitive. And the very first primitives have a very long array because they are not close to the root primitive. And this array contains all the parents. But there is a flaw with all these arrays. And that is that we have an index of minus one in all of these arrays. And for later use, we don't want this index. So we somehow want to remove this index of minus one. We can achieve this by, before we write the array to the attribute, let's first say parents is reverse parents. So we just reverse the order of the array such that all these minus ones are in the very first spot. And now we say remove index to remove one index from the array. The array is parents and the index to remove is zero. Now we remove the minus one. And 
if we have a look at the arrays now, of course the order is inverted, but at the same time all the minus ones are gone. And primitives that are root primitives, because they have a parent index of minus one already, don't have any parents in the array. So the array length is zero. Great. Next step. The, the next step, now that we have all the parent-child relation structure, is to create a matrix, so a transformation system. We want to put each individual primitive into its own coordinate space, basically. So we want to create a 4x4 four four matrix for all the primitives that specifies the global transform for this primitive when seen as an object. The very first step in creating such a system is to find the edge between a primitive and its parent because eventually it should rotate around this edge. So we have to place the origin of the new coordinate system here in the middle of this edge. So if we are looking at 726, here should be the origin of this system. So before we are dealing with matrices, let's first find this edge. And how can we find this edge? The easiest method is, as we are dealing with triangles, to look at the points, and this edge has two points, and these points are the same points in both triangles. So that is a criterion to find this edge. So let's implement this. Let's lay down another primitive wrangle, primitive wrangle, and let's call this one find edge points. Find edge points, and let's implement this. Let's find the edge points. Well, first we need all the points of the primitive and its parent. So int my points, this is an array, will be prim points, geometry stream zero, and then myself, so prim num. This will give all the points that are inside of the primitive that is currently processed. And now we need the exactly same information about the parent, so int par points for the parent points, another array, prim points, zero. But this time we use the parent ID and the parent ID is saved to an attribute already. So we can use this attribute, i at parent, like so. Now we have two arrays containing the points of the primitive and its parent. Now let's create the result array in edge points edge pnts, well, let's stay consistent and say points here, brackets, and we won't initialize this one. And now let's do a for each loop. For each, we want to run through all the points of the currently processed primitive. So int point, and my points is the array, like so. And now we want to do a second for each loop, because for every point of the currently processed primitive, we want to test all the points of the parent primitive. So another for each loop, for each. But this time running over the par point of the par points array. And again brackets. And now we can say if point, so the point inside of the currently processed primitive, is exactly the same as par pnt, so the point from the parent primitive, then append this point to our edge points array. pnt should be appended, like so. Great. So these will find all the points that are the same in both arrays. And now let's create another array attribute, i and then brackets, add edge points, and this will be edge points. Cool. Let's test this. Apply, accept, no errors so far, go to the geo spreadsheet. Here are the parents and here are the edge points. Okay, zero edge points. Let's see if this worked. Let's quickly find primitive zero, should be over here, 
there it is. Let's turn on point numbers. And the points are, the points are, well, first we have to see which parent it has. It is five, so five is a parent. So the points found should be 3832 and 3060. And it found 3832, Seems to work. So it found these two points, and with these two points we have this vector between them, and that is the edge. So after this wrangle, we have the edge between each individual primitive and its parent. But wait a second, what happens to root polygons? Let's see if we can quickly find one. So if I go to parent, here I have minus one, and you see now we have an empty array. And an empty array is not a good thing here because we need this vector for building the matrix. So we have to somehow deal with this situation. We have to do an exception for the primitives that have a minus one as a parent ID. So let's quickly do this. We'll open up the editor again. And let's introduce a special case. So let's correct the border case. If the border case is actually present. So if parent is smaller than zero, that is the case with all the root polys, then append to edge points just the very first point of the primitive, my points zero and let's copy this line like so and let's append point one so if we don't have a parent then just use the first two points of the primitive i have an error here probably a typo edge points let's see what it gives Okay, I missed the closing bracket on both of these lines. Apply accept. And now, although we have a parent ID of minus one, we have edge points. We do have edge points here. Great, so we corrected for this special case. Now it's time to create the matrix. So lay down a new primitive wrangle. And let's call it system. Now the magic happens. So let's build the system. Okay, Alt E again. Let's start by gathering all the necessary information. So first we need a vector which will be edge point, uh, edge position one. So using a point expression for this, we search geometry stream zero, the attribute position, and then I add edge points. And the index we want to read is zero, like so. Now this construct here is necessary because edge points is an attribute array. And it is necessary to specify i brackets. Oh, I forgot an at here. i brackets at to tell the point function that this is an array, otherwise it won't work. And then we want to read index zero because index zero is the very first point of the edge. We read the position from this one. And then let's copy the line like so. And this time we want to read edge points one because this array only has two points. Now that we have these two points, we can form the vector between them. So vector edge is edge plus two minus edge plus one. Why edge plus two minus one? Because uh, tails first, so it's pointing to edge plus two. Now we can create our basis. Basis. So, for the basis of a transformation matrix, we need four vectors. The x, y, and z axis, and the transform, so the origin of the coordinate system. And uh, you, Houdini uses the convention for the names of these vectors, and that is normal, tangent, and bitangent. So let's start with the bitangent, that is, so to speak, the x-axis. 
vector by tangent, and this should be the normalized edge vector. So normalize the edge, our first direction for the new matrix. Now we need the normal, but in this case the normal of the polygon. So vector normal will just be add n. If you wonder why you don't need a v in front of the add sign here to specify that this is a vector, that is because n is a standard attribute of Houdini, and so Vax knows that this will be a vector. And uh, then vector number three is tangent, and that will just be the cross product between bitangent and normal, because the cross product of two vectors gives the vector that is orthogonal to the plane spanned by the two vectors, and that is exactly what we need for an orthogonal matrix. So tangent will be normalize cross to form the cross product between bitangent and normal like so. And last but not least, we need a fourth vector, the vector called origin. And this origin is just the center point of the edge. And to reach this center point, the formula is edge plus one. So we start at one of the points, at the first point, and now we add the edge vector, but only half of it. So we multiply by 0.5 like so. And this gives exactly the center point of the edge. Now we have our four vectors. Time to create a matrix. So let's create a matrix attribute, matrix, and let's call it xform. And with a set function you can directly set the four vectors of the matrix. So by tangent, normal, tangent, and origin. 4x4 four four transformation matrices in Houdini work that way. First comes the x-axis, then the y-axis, then the z-axis, and then the transform. Great, and now we can write this to an attribute. So 4 at x-form is x-form, like so. Let's see if we did mistakes, and of course we did a lot of them. So vector edge plus one, I missed to change this to a two. And now everything works except, let's get rid of all these numbers and let's check the attribute spreadsheet. And here we have a X form matrix. It is composed of 16 floats. Here we have the first vector, one, two, three, four components because all the transformation matrices of course are square. And the second vector, one, two, three, four, and the fourth vector, one, two, three, four, and then uh, the third vector, and then the origin, one, two, three, four. But if you deal with transformation matrices a lot, you probably know that they are formulated in homogeneous coordinates. That means they are containing four components instead of three, although it's three D vectors, not four D vectors. And the last component, this one here, is used to determine if the vector is a rotation vector or if the vector is a translation vector. And to create a proper homogeneous matrix formulated in homogeneous coordinates, these values here, these ones for the very first three vectors should be zero, not one, because these three are the rotation part of the matrix. So we have to somehow set these components to zero. Otherwise, it won't work. And we can do that. So let's quickly go into our code again and just set these components to zero. And we can use the component syntax of matrices with vex for this. So xform dot xa. And that means please target the fourth component of the first vector. So the x refers to the very first vector and a is the fourth component of this. And this should be a zero, not a one. Then x form ya, you guessed it, should be zero. And then x form za should be zero, two, like so. Let's see what this gives, apply and accept.
and now these are zeros. There would be, in principle, a lot to say about homogeneous matrices, and I will do so in a future tutorial, but for now just take my word that it is necessary to set this fourth component of the rotation vectors to zero for the whole thing to work. And why has this value been 1 in the first place? Well, because we use standard vector 3s. And when Houdini converts a vector 3 into a vector 4, it sets the fourth component to 1, because it assumes it is a point. And that is why we had 1s here. And now we corrected this. So let's check what we have visually. Switch back to the viewport, and let's create a visualizer. A new marker and the attribute to visualize is x form or x form and x is class auto works, show error tips and less length to the vectors. And you see, this is a system that we created. And you see, it is orthogonal, which is good, and it is oriented with one of the edges of the poly. So the red vector is always parallel to one of the edges, especially the edge between the polygon and its parent. But unfortunately, there is another problem. And the problem is that due to the arbitrary ordering of the point numbers, sometimes the red vector is pointing to the left and sometimes it's pointing to the right. And what we need is some consistent behavior here. So there should be an order to this direction of the red vector, so the bitangent. It should always point in this direction, for example, no matter what the point order of the edge points is. So we need to come up with a correction for this again. And how can we correct this? Well, we can compare this bitangent vector to the vector that connects the center point of this polygon with the center point of its parent. And this vector should, for example, always point to the left of this vector, or always to the right, but always into the same direction. So let's implement this correction quickly. It's not too bad. We have to do this before we create the matrix, so we have to correct the vectors. So let's introduce a new section called direction, correction, like so. First, let's get the parent position, so a vector, Let's call it parpos and let's use a prim expression or a prim function on geometry stream zero to get the position of i at i at parent. That is the position of our parent. And now we can form the vector between our own position and the position of the parent. So vector pardir for parent direction is at p, which is our current position, minus par pos, like so. And now we can use the dot product between this vector and the bitangent, or the tangent, to see if it is oriented correctly or not. Because the tangent is the vector that points in the direction between the two triangles. And if it is pointing in the same direction as the vector connecting the two, then the dot product will be positive. If it points in the opposite direction, the dot product will be negative. So we can use a dot product between these two vectors to do a test. So let's write if dot tangent with pardir parent direction is smaller than zero. So if the tangent is looking into the wrong direction, so to speak, if this is the case, then please invert tangent. Tangent times equals minus one, like so. And if I now press apply, you see some of these have switched. Let me undo this by quickly commenting this out. You see, these switched, and if I do this again, they switch again. And now they are pointing always into the same direction, basically, regarding the parent, of course. Okay, now that we have that, apply and accept, and we are done with the system. 
So I think we reached a milestone here because we created a global coordinate system for each individual primitive. So we converted this object to consist of little object, so to speak, because each primitive now has its own transformation matrix, just like an object on scene level. That is a milestone. That is the most important part with the entire effect. But to reach our final goal of curling this up and splitting it up, there are still a lot of angles to be implemented. And that's why I think it's best to wrap it up here, call this part one and create a second part very soon that shows the rest of the tutorial. The tutorial already runs more than 30 minutes and I think your brains might be full by now. So give yourself a pause and uh, stay tuned while I create part two and finish the effect. And now it's time to really thank all our patrons, especially PU Online Learning, Important Looking Pirates, Kyoko Sakane, Derek A. Johnson, Nick Nick, Chris Ever, Rafik Anadol, Rob Bryant Jr. and Mohamed Alabri. Thank you so much for your continued support. Without you, this all wouldn't be possible. Thanks.